Insect hatches are one of the best times to catch trout. You know right where they are, you know they're actively feeding, and with a little bit of observation, you can get a pretty good idea of what they're eating. So it's just a matter of picking a fly out of your box, throwing it over them, catching fish, right? But it's not always that easy. In this show, we're gonna show you some special techniques for identifying the flies, drifting the fly over the fish, and taking advantage of these great fishing opportunities. Oh yeah, nice fish! That fish has already refused that fly. You're going to have to try just a slightly different pattern. The roll cast pickup is a great cast to use in a lot of fishing situations. This is a beautiful wild trout from a small stream. Just a gorgeous little fish. I say hit that bank. Let's go to that grass bed. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing, Yellowstone Teton Territory, Crazy Rainbow Ranch, Adipose Boat Works, Global Rescue, Trout Unlimited, Oscar Blues Brewery. There are four major groups of trout stream insects that hatch in or near the water. You don't need to be able to identify them that closely. Entomology has scared more people away from fly fishing than anything except knots. But it does help to identify the insects into their broad groups or orders because each one has a different life cycle and trout don't always respond to every stage of their life. The most important trout stream insects are mayflies, caddisflies, stoneflies, and midges. You can get into more detail on these insects if you want, and it can help because hatches change with the season, and it doesn't hurt to know about each one. But for basic knowledge, just being able to tell the difference between these is important. In most rivers, mayflies are the most important trout stream insect. They live as larvae for almost a full year underwater and then rise to the surface to hatch into what we call a dun or a subadult. These flies then fly into nearby trees, molt, and turn into the full adult called a spinner in a day or two, which then return to the water and lay their eggs. Trout eat the nymphs or larvae throughout the season but they only have access to the adults when they rise to the surface, when they flood around the water after they first hatch, and then when they return to the river to lay eggs because the adults then fall to the water and die. But when the flies hatch or return to lay eggs, they're concentrated in vast numbers at once and trout take advantage of the insects and feed with abandon. In fact, Trout often lose their normal caution at the height of a hatch and can be approached more easily, which is another reason we love hatches. So mayfly spinners are the final egg-laying form of the mayfly, and they hover over the riffles. They do this mating dance, and they're, they're kind of, they kind of bounce up and down, and you'll see them hit the water occasionally. Eventually, they're all going to fall to the water, and trout love them. So, you know, if you see these spinners over the water, you want to try to grab one to see about what size and what color they are, because it's hard to tell when they're in the air just exactly what color and size they are. So just take your hat and swipe at them, grab one like I did here, and now later on if the spinners fall to the water, I know what fly to put on. Caddisflies are perhaps the second most important group of trout stream insects. They have a slightly different life cycle. They also live on the river bottom as larvae, but many of them construct cases of sticks or stones, although some are free living and don't build cases. But just before they hatch into winged adults, they go into a pupa stage, which is a life stage that rises to the surface. Once the pupa reaches the surface, it struggles to emerge as a winged adult just under the surface. The flies are helpless here, so trout often key into them because they're an easy meal. Once caddisflies emerged as a winged adult, they most often hop and skitter briefly and then fly away. 
So although trout eat the adults, they're more likely to eat the emerging pupae. Then caddis enter their deceptive stage. They are a dishonest insect. Once hatched, they can live for up to a month out of the water before returning to the water to lay their eggs. Every day they form big migrations and fly upstream in groups. And although it might look like a hatch because you see so many flies in the air, most of these caddis adults never touch the water, so they're out of reach of the trout. Only when the caddis flies return to the water to mate and lay eggs and die after mating, just like mayflies, are they on the surface and available for a trout meal. These are called spent caddis, and like mayfly spinners, trout eat them with great abandon when it finally happens. Sometimes persistence pays off. We floated that caddis fly over this fish, I don't know how many times, good floats, didn't eat, didn't eat, but we were stubborn and didn't switch fly patterns and uh, finally ate the caddis. Finally ate it. You know, people, people think that, that trout are so selective, but you know, they're pretty opportunistic. And if the fly, the fly is decent and it, they're feeding heavily and it floats over them and it's kind of in the ballpark, usually with good presentation, you can take the fish. Well done. Stoneflies have yet a different life cycle and behavior. Like the other two, they have a larval stage underwater, but they don't hatch on the water surface like mayflies and caddisflies. These insects crawl to streamside rocks and vegetation and hatch into adults out of the water on the bank, so the adults are not available as often to the trout. However, stonefly adults are clumsy flyers and they often get blown into the water by the wind or they fall on the surface and are also available to trout when they return to the water to lay eggs. Midges are so small that they might seem insignificant, but they can be an important source of trout food. In fact, in tailwater rivers below dams, they can be the primary source of trout food. And if you fish these rivers, you better pay attention to midges. Midges start life as a worm-like larva that trout eat in great quantities. Like caddisflies, they have a pupa stage, which is readily spotted by the trout near the surface and easy to capture. And like caddisflies, midges fly away quickly once they sprout their wings. But trout do eat the adults as well, especially when it's really cold or windy and the flies have trouble taking off. Midges also return to the water to mate, lay eggs, and die, and they often form large clusters of from two to dozens of insects hooked together. Trout eat these midge clusters, and it allows you to fish a bigger fly when imitating these tiny insects. How do trout respond to these hatches? Well, sometimes they don't respond, which is very frustrating. Maybe the water's too cold and the fish are reluctant to come to the surface. Sometimes the hatch is not heavy enough to interest trout. Maybe the trout are just acting like jerks. But when they do respond, trout first begin to eat the nymphs close to the bottom as the insects get active before their migration to the surface. This is a good time to fish a nymph. Then, as the insects begin to drift in the current, as they rise to the surface, trout begin to intercept them more in midwater and will feed closer to the surface. Finally, the fish will feed at all levels or may even concentrate mostly on insects trapped at the surface. This is the height of the hatch, when fish feed most actively and gives you some of the best fishing because they lose most of their caution in their eagerness to feed. When insects first reach the surface, they have two problems. First, the meniscus represents a physical barrier to the insects. And also at this point, they need to emerge from their larval skin and hatch into a winged adult. This can happen quickly or it can take minutes. Trout know these struggling insects are easy pickings and they seem to prefer them in this stage, which we call an emerger. Once the winged adults have emerged, sometimes they ride the water for a long time, especially if it's cold or rainy. On dry, sunny days, the insects may fly away almost immediately. The longer an insect rides the water, the more likely it is that a trout will feed on the adult. Then, 
Once insects return to the water to mate and lay eggs, typically in large groups, trout wait for the dead and dying flies lying spent in the water to wash down where they can be eaten. If just one insect is hatching, the puzzle's not that hard to figure out. However, if more than one insect is hatching at the same time, you should try to figure out which one the trout prefer. You can try to observe which one they are eating by watching fish rise, trying to determine which insect disappears in the rise. But that's often difficult, and it's not always easy to tell which stage the trout are taking. Are they eating the emerger just under the surface, or are they eating the fully emerged adult, or are they eating both? Sometimes trout eat all of them at all stages, but sometimes they get picky and prefer one type or one stage. If you observe the rise forms of the trout though, you may pick up some clues. If a rise is very splashy, the fish is probably either taking emergers or eating a large fluttering insect. If there are no bubbles in the rise form, the trout is taking an emerger just under the surface. If there are bubbles in the rise form, the trout is taking flies off the surface because as they feed on the surface, they ingest air, which is then expelled through their gills. If the rise is subtle and just produces a ring, trout are usually taking small insects on the surface, mayfly spinners, or spent egg-laying caddis. Now you have at least a guess on what type of insect trout are eating and what stage. You may not get it totally right, but at least you have some clues to go on. How do you make sure you have the best fly? You probably don't need an exact imitation of the insect trout are feeding on. You need something that's close enough to fool a trout as it floats by. And even in relatively slow water, trout don't have that much time to inspect a fly. So as long as it's close and behaving naturally, you have a good chance of fooling a trout. They're wary, but honestly, they aren't that smart. Most experienced fly fishers agree that the size of the fly is the most important factor. Trout often ignore something that is smaller than their current food and are suspicious of something that's larger. They just want to eat what's safe and has already been identified as food and anything that falls outside of that box is just debris to them. If you can catch a sample of the insect in question, put it on the lid of your fly box and match it to something in your box. If you only see flies in the air or on the water and can't catch a sample, pick a fly that's a size or two smaller than what you think you see. Flies in the air and on the water always look much bigger than their true size. I can't tell you why, but it always fools me. Next in importance is shape. Does the fly have an upright wing or are the wings held close to the body? The profile of a fly can be what triggers trout to feed. So pick a fly with an upright wing if you think the fish are eating mayflies and one with a wing close to the body if you think they're taking caddis. Is it a spent mayfly or one that just hatched? Flies that have just hatched have upright wings but spent mayfly spinners have wings spread out on the surface and ride low to the water. If you suspect fish are taking an emerger, a fly with short wings or just wing stubs and perhaps a shuck to imitate the nymph skin the insect is trying to wriggle out of might be in order. He's chomping. That's more like it. Get out of that moss. Get out of that moss. So we have had a lot of trouble catching these fish. They got really, really snotty. And um, what I did was I went to a longer tippet and a smaller fly. And sometimes that'll do the trick for you. Ha! <laughs> 
trying to use side pressure here to, to lead the fish both ways. I hate having a fish that's, um, that's straight downstream from me because the fly pulls out more easily there. So it's a little tough at this angle to keep side pressure. I'm gonna to have to eventually bring them straight up um, to get them close to the boat. But if I get them up here, then I can side pressure them right into the net. So he's ready, so I'm just gonna slide him in and Addie's hopefully, yeah, <laughs> gonna net him. Thank you, Addie. Thank you for the great boat positioning. You know, fishing during a hatch from a boat, the positioning of the boat is absolutely critical. And it's not like you're waiting, you can move around. You have to put the boat in the right place and stay there. And Addie just slid that boat in beautifully, right in range, enabled us to get a good presentation of the fish. So Addie, how important do you think color is during a hatch? Well, I think trying to emulate the flies that you see, obviously color, pattern, um, we want to match that to the best of our ability mm -hmm. uh, to put it on the water and present it to the fish mm -hmm. um, as if it belongs there. Um, I don't think it's always important that it needs to be an exact color. Mm -hmm. You know, today we're throwing some stuff that has purple on it. Yeah, yeah, right? yeah. And, and so, the flies are black. And the flies are black. So I don't think it's it's always a must, mm -hmm. but we want to be in the, in the general area, I okay. think, to match the hatch. Uh -huh. yeah. There's a dispute on how well fish can see color or whether it matters. And most guides will give you a similar answer to what Addie told me here. But hedge your bets and try to match the insect as closely as you can. If fish are taking an insect with a yellow body and cream wings, an imitation with a yellowish body and brownish wings should work okay. A fly with an olive body and dark gray wings might not. Just try to get the shade as close as you can. The right leader is almost as important as the right fly. This is not that difficult, but when fishing hatches, with fish close to the surface, you want to ensure your fly lands with stealth. You should be using a 9-foot leader at minimum, and it's usually better to go to a 12-footer, because when casting to trout, you want to keep the thicker fly line as far away as possible. A fly line makes a much bigger splash than a leader. I would use the lightest tippet possible for the size fly you're using. So if you're fishing a size 16 fly and the tippet chart says you can use a 4X, 5X, or 6X, or the old rule of thumb, dividing the fly size by three to get the tippet size, which would give you 5X. I would go with 6X in this case. Unless the water is really fast and broken, or very dirty, or the fish are quite large. Your fly should be treated with something to help it float if you're imitating an adult insect. Oh yeah, there we go! The best way to do this is to smear a small amount of fly paste on the fly. Then, when the fly stops floating, or after you catch a fish on it, treat the fly with white desiccant powder, which retreats the fly and adds a new coating of silicone. You can start right out with the powder if you want, but the converse doesn't work. Once a fly is wet, the silicone paste doesn't adhere to the fly properly. That fish was a real pain. There's a bunch of fish over here that have been very annoying and very hard to get, and they wouldn't take my dry fly. So what I did was I switched to an emerger just hanging in the film, and that sometimes does the trick. There are a number of ways you can fish emergers. One is to just put no floating or anything on it and throw it out there, let it sink a little bit below the surface, and you'll see the rise anyway. The fish will still make a swirl when it takes the emerger. Another way to do it is you can put floating on an emerger because it's still gonna ride low in the surface film. It doesn't have that bushy hackle or anything. Another way to do it is to grease your leader just an inch or two from the fly. The grease leader will float and the fly will just ride just under the surface and you'll see that leader twitch when the fish takes it. You got the right fly, you hope. 
and it's all ready to go on your leader. But before you hit the water, it's important to learn the reach cast. It's one of the best ways to get a natural drift during a hatch. And if you don't know how to do it, you're really not in the game. Let's go talk to casting instructor Pete Kutzer about how to properly do the reach cast. Hi, I'm Pete Kutzer with the Orvis Fly Fishing Schools. Today I want to talk to you about the reach cast and reach cast modifications. The reach cast is by far, I feel, the most important and useful tool when you're fishing any kind of moving water. This reach cast allows us to reposition the fly line so we get a nice drag-free drift. When we make a cast across the river, that line is the largest mass on the water and that current's gonna have the most effect on it. It's gonna push that line, giving us a belly. So we need to get that line upstream of that fly. A lot of us just mend, but the reach cast takes the place of that mend and it actually sets you up for a better drift as soon as that fly lands. When I make a cast across the river, that line is gonna get pushed by the current. You can see this belly forming. My fly is now dragging away from my target and that's not good. If I make this cast, and then make a mend, that mend can also pull that fly away from that target. So this reach cast is gonna allow our fly to land with a drag-free natural drift right away. To make this reach cast, we're gonna make our cast, but after we stop the rod, before our fly lands, we're gonna reach upstream and we're gonna let some lines slide through our hands. If we hold on to this line, when we make this slide, our fly comes back towards us and we lose our accuracy or we lose our distance. So we have to make sure when we make this cast that we let the line slide through our hands. That's gonna allow our fly to stay out there where that fish is. Now, a traditional reach cast. We make the cast, make that reach, our rod's down here low, we can come back and now we start to follow that fly on down. We still have a relatively straight line to that fly. We can still have some varying currents that may affect that line. So what I like to do is a little bit of a modification to this reach cast. Rather than stopping my rod and lowering it down, I like to stop my rod and raise it up a little bit higher. That's gonna put less line on the water, giving you a little less drag, a little less belly, and a little bit of a longer natural drift. So I'm gonna make my cast. I'm gonna stop my rod high, sweep it high, and now I can follow that fly down with my rod a little bit higher. If I need to make a little mend, I have less line on the water that I have to work with. With my rod down low, I gotta work a little bit harder to make that larger mend. So again, I stop the rod high, reach high, now I can follow that fly down and get that nice natural drift. By doing this cast, now my leader is upstream on my fly as well. I'm getting a much more natural presentation than that leader downstream of that fly. Sometimes we're gonna to reach to the right, sometimes we're gonna to reach to the left. Practice this cast and I guarantee it's gonna help you catch a lot more fish. The most important part of fishing a hatch is to float your fly over a trout in a natural manner without spooking the fish. There he is. All right. Good job. Okay, I don't think he's that big. By his head shakes, it's not a... It's not giant. the big one? Huh? It's not the big no, one? No, no, it's not the big one. Not at all. Yeah, I'm sure I saw him. Okay. Nice one. Yeah. Nice one on a little dry fly. Whoop, missed it. Oh, look at the color on that fish. Mm. That's a nice dry fly fish. Yeah. Any day. When you're fishing a hatch, it's important to have the right fly, or a fly that's in the ballpark, but it's so important to get that drift just right. And on that cast, I made a little bit of a reach cast, a little upstream reach, and then I bumped the tip of the rod a little bit to throw a little bit more slack into that. The leader landed on the water with a little bit more slack. The fly floated naturally right over the fish, and he came up and took it confidently. Occasionally, moving a fly can work, but for the most part, you should try to eliminate drag so your fly floats along in the current at the exact same speed as the naturals. 
Sometimes this drag is obvious, but sometimes it's more subtle and not as easy to see from 30 feet away. You fish dry flies and emergers in exactly the same manner, dead drift. Getting the perfect float requires some planning before you make your first cast. Don't jump right in and flail away. Although some hatches only last for an hour, so you'll still do better if you take your time. First, pick a fish and watch its rise rhythm. If you have a choice of multiple fish, look for the one that's rising steadily. A trout that rises infrequently is much more difficult to catch than one that rises every few seconds and is preoccupied with feeding. And try to estimate the fish's cadence. How often does it rise? Try to pitch your fly over the fish just before you think the next rise will occur. They aren't always reliably predictable, but it's worth a try. Next, look at the currents between you and the fish. If you have to put your line and leader over multiple currents, the chance of the fly dragging is greatly increased as those currents yank the line and leader away from the fly. Is there any opportunity for you to carefully wade into a different position so that you can cast over just a single current lane? One option is to wade directly behind the fish in the same current lane so that you can fish directly upstream to it. But you can't always do that because of deep or fast water. Another option is to carefully wade above the fish and cast downstream to it. This requires careful wading because it'll be easier for the fish to notice you and it works best on wider rivers where you can stay far enough away from the fish to avoid spooking it. This is a great trick to use because the fly floats over the fish before the leader, but it requires careful use of a reach cast or a slack line cast or your fly will drag almost immediately. This beautiful fat cutthroat is a good example of changing your positions during a hatch. I had been fishing from this bank and getting a little bit of drag, I guess, because the fish on the far side of the seam just wouldn't take the fly. They'd refuse it. They, I could see them coming up and looking at it. They wouldn't take it. So I moved myself around to the tail of the pool so I could shoot straight upstream to the fish and bingo, it worked. So if a fish is steadily rising, making a nice sedate sipping, and you throw your fly out there, and all of a sudden the fish takes the fly with a tremendous splash, and you don't hook it, that's a refusal. That fish changed its mind at the last minute, closed its mouth, and its momentum made the splash. The strategy there is to switch flies if the fish keeps rising. Sometimes they stop rising, but if the fish does keep rising, that fish has already refused that fly. It knows that fly, and you're gonna have to try just a slightly different pattern in that circumstance. But not all refusals are splashy. Sometimes a trout will just bump the fly with its snout, but never open its mouth, or it will swirl right next to the fly. It's hard to determine whether a trout has refused your fly or you just missed setting the hook, but your strategy should be the same. Pick a slightly different fly and avoid drag at all costs. What do you do if the fish does not take your fly? First, make sure you aren't casting short. Don't cast right to the rise because the trout may not see your fly. When trout rise, they drop back and inhale the insect, then swim a bit forward to regain their spot. And accuracy is so important because many fish won't move more than a few inches for a fly. What? I don't understand it. Are they not eating those big mayflies? So I am being totally humiliated by these cutthroats. Cutthroat trout are supposed to be stupid, right? Well, these fish are not stupid. And I've put four different fly changes over the fish. I've tried my best presentations. It's just not working. So in a situation like that, during a hatch, 
one of the things you suspect is drag. So what I'm gonna do is put on a longer, lighter tippet. I had 4X on, I'm gonna go to 5X and I'm gonna put a pretty long tippet on. Hopefully I can get a better drift and I'll change flies too, just to make sure. It's so great when it all comes together. Fishing hatches is not always easy, but it's always an intellectual challenge, even though we're playing against a critter with a brain the size of an almond. Common misconception. Cutthroat are stupid. Here, I'll, I'll get him in, Jeremy, sorry. Cutthroat are stupid and they don't fight. Well, we just disproved both of those things with this nice guy. Beautiful cutthroat. Ah! Wow. So, longer tippet, different fly. Jeremy gave me a beautiful green drake imitation. Bingo, about the second cast. So sometimes it just takes a little bit of change in your tackle to make the difference. God, beautiful. They are gorgeous, hard to beat. I hope you enjoyed the show. Fishing to hatches doesn't have to be that complicated, but you can take it to any level you want. That's the fun of fly fishing. But with a little bit of basic entomology, presentation skills, and observation, you'll have lots of fun during hatches. The Orvis Guide to Fly Fishing is supported by Orvis Fly Fishing Yellowstone Teton Territory Crazy Rainbow Ranch Adipose Boat Works Global Rescue Trout Unlimited Oscar Blues Brewery